Hello, my name is Jonathan Sullivan, and I'm the Director of Catechetical Ministries for the Diocese of Springfield in Illinois. This is a recording of a webinar that my office put on in October of 2009 entitled Social Networking, a Primer for Catholic Teachers and Catechists. I'd like to begin this recording with a quick prayer. This is a prayer from a new book entitled Treasures Old and New by Father Philip Neri Powell. Father Powell is a Dominican priest currently studying in Rome and a friend of mine from my graduate studies, so he has allowed me to use this prayer to open up this, uh, this recording. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of hope, you are the goodness of your creation, and all things you have created are good. From your perfection came everything that is, and to you all who love you will return. We do not live our lives as gambles against death, but rather as living signs of your promises fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Transform our lives in the hope of life eternal. Send us out to bring hope to your world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'd like to give just a quick overview of our time together. Uh, we're going to begin uh, by looking at two quotes from the Church's teaching on social communication, just to get kind of a context for uh, how the Church approaches communication technologies. We'll give sort of a working definition of what social networking is, and take a look at three of the largest social networking sites on the Internet today, as well as a quick overview of some of the smaller sites you should be aware of. And then we'll get into the free advice portion uh, of the recording and talk about first some general tips for getting involved in social networking. And secondly, uh, what I feel some of the special issues for Catholic teachers and catechists are, uh, some things they should be aware of if they choose to get involved in social networking. So let's begin. The Church has a long history of teaching on social communications. Uh, the quote here upon the screen right now is from Intermorifica, the Second Vatican Council's Decree on Social Communications, and it reads, All the children of the Church should join, without delay and with the greatest effort in a common work, to make effective use of the media of social communication in various apostolic endeavors as circumstances and conditions demand. So here we have the church saying that uh, communication technologies are a good, or can be used for the good at least, uh, on behalf of the wider human community and for the specific work of the church. Uh, you know, the, if we are a uh, church that has been commissioned to spread the gospel to every corner of the world, then obviously communication technologies will have a great impact on how we go about doing that. Which is not to say that there are no dangers whatsoever in social communication. In 2002, the Pontifical Council for Social Communications released a document looking at uh, some of the ethical implications of the Internet, and they said, we are particularly concerned about the cultural dimensions of what is now taking place. Precisely as powerful tools of the globalization process, the new information technology and the Internet transmit and help instill a set of cultural values, ways of thinking about social relationships, family, religion, the human condition, whose novelty and glamour can challenge and overwhelm traditional cultures. And so what this is saying is uh, communication technologies are not just something that we use, but they're something that inform our way of thinking about the world. They inform our way of thinking about our relationships. Sherry Turkle, who I think can kind of best be described as a, a psychologist of technology, uh, wrote a book called Life on the Screen in which she examined some of these implications. And one of uh, her points in that book is to say that in the past, human relationships were largely defined by geography. The people that you knew and interacted with on a regular basis were the people who lived near you. And you had to make so certain you had to make certain accommodations to those people. You might live next door to someone who has different beliefs or different values than you do, and you had to accommodate that in some way if you were going to live peacefully um, right next door to them. So geography was the defining uh, characteristic of our relationships. Nowadays, that's starting to shift a bit. Uh, Dr. Turkle says that now we're starting to overcome the tyranny of geography, and we can start to base our relationship on mutual interests, even with people uh, far, far away from us. This is what the Internet has allowed. Um, we can pick and choose who we interact with, and we can really limit our exposure to competing values and competing beliefs. And we can see this uh, as one prominent example with cable news uh, channels 
we can pick and choose which cable news channels we're going to watch based on our own personal political preferences and we can limit uh, the competing viewpoints that we let into our consciousness. Uh, so we just reinforce what we already believe and don't have to make some of those accommodations that we had to do in the past based on geography. So this is going to have some implications then for the way that we think about social networking. And it, it's interesting, we can even see this shift uh, based on the dominant metaphor used in certain internet sites. Uh, when the internet was first sort of in its infancy, you had sites like GeoCities that allowed people to build their own websites. But the interesting thing about GeoCities is it would group those websites based on uh, interests, but it called those groups neighborhoods. So your website would be located in a certain neighborhood. So you still had this metaphor of location uh, that you would be uh, next to someone virtually speaking, but still had that dominant metaphor of the neighborhood. Nowadays we're shifting away from that and the dominant metaphor is becoming the individual. When you think about my space, it's not our space, it's my space. It's my page, my entry into the internet, my way of disseminating my information. Uh, and so the, you know we've lost that sort of dominant metaphor of uh, the, the relationship. It's all about me now. So this then brings us to the question, what is social networking? And I want to offer two uh, sort of working definitions. You can do a lot of reading about what social networking is, and there's a, a variety of sort of competing definitions. But I want to offer two very simple ways to think about social networking for our purposes here today. And the first is that <coughs> social networking is a way of mapping out our relationships. It's a way of seeing how we're connected uh, with our friends. We can demonstrate this very, very simply here up on the screen. If we imagine that the blue circle is me and the red circle is my friends, I can draw a line between my friends and I to show how we're related. So we can see who I'm linked to. We can see that I have some friends in common, some people that I know that also know each other. And so we have a very simple relationship map here uh, up on the screen. But we can take this another step further. We can see not only my friends, but if we wanted to, we could plot my friends' friends. The people that my friends know that I don't know. Maybe I hear them talk about this guy that they work with or something like that, but I've never met them face-to-face, -face, so I don't have a relationship with them. Uh, so we can fill in with the green circles, my friends' friends, and draw in our lines there. And so we've extended our map now. And we can keep going with this. Now, if we wanted to, we could show my friends' friends' friends with the black circles and put in those lines. And so now we're starting to create a network, a way of seeing how the different pieces, these different people, are connected in their relationships. Uh, in a way, it's kind of a giant game of six degrees of separation, or if you've ever played Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, where you try to link actors with Kevin Bacon based on who's been in movies with who. It's a very similar sort of thing. It's almost like a game, seeing how far out we connect, can connect people. And if you wanted to, obviously, you could go out and connect everyone in the world and see how they're all related. But So that's sort of the first way I want to think about social networking today, is a way of mapping out our relationships, seeing who's connected with who. And the second way is a little more... Uh, practical, and that's that social, social networking over time has become a communication tool. Uh, because there are so many people now on social networking sites, uh, these sites have really become a way to reconnect with old friends, say from high school that you've lost touch with, uh, communicating information to a large group of people at once, uh, maybe pictures of a new baby or uh, news that you've got a new job. Uh, it's even become a game platform. Sites like Facebook and MySpace now have games embedded into them so that I can play a game of chess with my best friend in Washington, D.C. on the computer, each of us taking turns over a course of days uh, to play out a chess game. So. Uh, and we actually have, have seen studies now that show that for young people, uh, social networking has become sort of their dominant means of communication. Uh, in the past, you know, we had email as sort of the dominant way of people to communicate online. Instant messaging was very big for a while. But now sites like Facebook have become sort of the uh, address book of the new generation. Whereas, you know, my mother's generation had a physical book that they would write addresses and phone numbers in for friends and family. Uh, because so many people are on Facebook now, especially young people, uh, you have all their contact information right there linked to your account. So that you don't even need to write down those things anymore. You can just go online if you need uh, Joe's phone number or Sally's address. Those things are attached to their profile. And so they can see uh, my information. I can see theirs. And we can just communicate that way now. We don't even need the physical address book anymore. 
So now I want to take a look at sort of the big three social networking sites right now. And, and the first one is the biggest, and that's Facebook. Facebook was launched in 2004 by Mark Zuckerberg, who at the time was a 20-year-old college student at Harvard University. And he modeled Facebook on his high school's physical Facebook, which is a, a kind of little brochure with all the students' names and pictures on them, so that as you're walking through the school, you can put names to faces and know who's in your class. Uh, and he thought this was a really neat idea. Uh, and when he got to Harvard, thought that this would be a great way for people to get to know each other and recognize each other on campus. So we created an online Facebook. At first, it was only open up to the students of Harvard, and as people got into it and really started enjoying it, he opened it up to anyone uh, at any college, uh, and then opened it up to high school students, and now it's open to anyone over the age of 13. In March of 2009, Facebook saw 276 million unique visitors to the site. Uh, that's 276 million individual people who visited Facebook in that one month, making them by far the largest social networking site on the Internet. This is my Facebook page, uh, and I want to just sort of show a couple of the uh, salient features of Facebook. Uh, the first is up here at the top, and that is what is what is called your status. And your status is just a quick little message that you can send to people, uh, just sort of updating them on what you're doing right now or what you're thinking about. You can ask a question or tell a joke, whatever you want to do in your status. It's just a little uh, what are you thinking right now sort of option. Under your status, you have what's called the wall. And the wall does a couple things. It uh, gives you sort of a running archive of your past statuses. Uh, it can also show some of your recent activities, so if you've wrote on someone's wall or become a fan of someone else. It also allows people to comment on your statuses. So here, the I did this, uh, took a this screenshot a couple of weeks ago, right after I'd found out that I had a nephew on the way. And you can see I have a couple of cousins here who are asking for details and wanting to know... Uh, about my new nephew, so they were able to uh, to comment on that status and ask those questions, and I can answer back and, and answer those questions for them. Another important feature is up here, what's called the tabs, and the tabs uh, link you to different portions of your profile, and you can customize these to a certain extent. You can take away some of these boxes, but uh, almost all of them will have, you know, the wall tab, obviously, and then an info tab. The info tab, if you were to click on that, would take you to my information page. And this shows you sort of my personal profile information. So it includes things like my birthday, uh, some of my relationships, you know, family that I've got on Facebook that I can link to. There's a place where you can share your religious views if you want. You can also show, uh, share things like your political views, things like your favorite music, your favorite movies, some quotations you enjoy, those sorts of things. And uh, the thing I want to point out here is you don't have to share all this stuff. Uh, you can choose not to type all this stuff in, and that's fine. It's up to you how much it is that you want to share with the other people that uh, you've friended on Facebook. So that's sort of the, an over quick overview of what Facebook is like. The second major social networking site is MySpace. MySpace was actually launched before Facebook, about a year before, in 2003, and is currently owned by Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation, in March of 2009, MySpace saw 124 million unique visitors, so they're not quite half as large as Facebook is right now. Uh, but Facebook really, ever since about February of 2008, which is when Facebook became larger than MySpace, Facebook has really been outpacing MySpace in terms of growth. And the, the reason for that is kind of interesting. Uh, if you go back and take a look at my uh, MySpace profile here, this is what, uh, or my Facebook page, this is what just about everyone's Facebook page is going to look like. There's not a whole lot of options for customization here. The information is usually in just about the same place. Uh, you can change the order just a little bit, but you can't change the blue color. You can't change where your profile picture is going to be. Uh, all that, it's a very standard template that everyone uses in Facebook. MySpace, on the other hand, allows a ton of customization. Uh, once you've gotten in and have an account, you can change your background color, you can change the colors of the font, add pictures all over the place, choose where your information goes. Um, just allows just a lot of personalization, which ironically makes it less user-friendly. Because if you're using these sites to find out information about your friends and look at their information and whatnot, uh, by allowing you to change the colors and do whatever you want with your page, MySpace has made it hard to find that information because it's going to be in different places for different people. 
Facebook, on the other hand, by keeping a very rigid template, makes it very easy to find that information because you always know where to go to find it. So I think that's one of the reasons that MySpace has kind of uh, fallen behind compared to Facebook is because it's a little less user-friendly to find that information. The one exception in terms of that, though, is for musical artists. MySpace actually started as a place for musical artists to be able to set up profiles as a way to be able to communicate with fans or share their music. They can upload music that other people can listen to. And MySpace really remains a popular place for musical acts because those multimedia tools are much more robust in MySpace than they are in Facebook. But otherwise, Facebook has really, um, for the past almost two years now, really been outpacing MySpace in terms of growth. The third site I want to mention is LinkedIn, and LinkedIn is different from MySpace or Facebook. Uh, whereas those first two are really about sharing your personal information, LinkedIn is a professional site. It's a way to communicate and link up with uh, people that you've worked with or people that you've done business with, uh, anyone from your former boss to your plumber. Uh, it was launched in 2003 and is owned by a, a private corporation. Uh, and currently has the best number I've been able to find is 50 million. I think that number's a little old. They're probably larger than that by this point, but that's the last best number that I could find during my quick search. And so there's sort of two pieces to LinkedIn. The first is it can act as your online resume. It allows you to post your previous work experience, your education, a uh, summary of your past experience, those sorts of things. Uh, so it's a way to kind of promote yourself if you're looking for a job. Um, it's a way that... Uh, potential employers can search your information and see if you've got the skills and background that they're looking for. The second way is, like I said, uh, instead of friending people on LinkedIn, you establish what are called connections. And those connections, like I mentioned, are people that you've worked with or know you in a professional capacity. And so in addition to being an online resume, LinkedIn can also act as an online Rolodex. It can be that place where you keep all of your business contacts. I uh, can, uh, can communicate with them through this site. This is my LinkedIn page here, and like I said, uh, you can see uh, it's got a number of features. It's got my current position, some of my past experience, my education. Uh, that's my the number of my connections here. Uh, LinkedIn also allows you to recommend people. You can write up little recommendations. So I've sent out some recommendations to people that I've worked with in the past, and a few people have, have uh, sent in recommendations for me. So this is uh, what LinkedIn kind of looks like uh, and allows you to connect with your professional contacts as opposed to your personal contacts, which is what Facebook and MySpace are kind of aimed at. Now, in addition to the big three, there's a large number of other uh, smaller or more specialized social networking sites, and I want to mention a few of those very quickly. The first, which is in the news a lot right now, is called Twitter. And Twitter is a social networking site, but it's maybe a little more correct to call it a micro-blogging site. You might be familiar with a typical blog in which people can keep an online journal, uh, maybe about you know stuff going on in their personal life, or there might be uh, they might keep a blog on a certain topic, like uh, some uh, their workplace or uh, political blog, those sorts of things. So Twitter is a, a blogging site, but it's a micro-blogging site. And the difference is Twitter only allows you to post up to 140 characters. Now, that's not even 140 words, but 140 individual letters, numbers, and characters. So the, the way I almost like to think about it is if you've got your status on Facebook, which is a short little blast that you can send out, Twitter is like Facebook, but only your status update. That's all you can do with it. On Twitter, then you can set up an account, you can send out these little blasts, and you can follow other people who have set up Twitter accounts. And then you can see, sort of in something similar to the wall on Facebook, a running uh, log of all the people that you're following and all the tweets that they have sent out. Uh, Twitter has just exploded in the last couple of years, especially once uh, some celebrities got on board and started uh, sending out tweets to, to their fans and whatnot. Uh, it's a, a really interesting way to kind of get a real quick sense of what people are thinking about any given topic. So if there's some big news story that's just hit, you can get on Tweet, you can search for that news topic and, and get a real quick sense of what people are saying about that topic. Delicious is a social bookmarking site. So if you think about the bookmarks or favorites that you keep in your uh, web browser, those websites that you go back on a regular basis. Uh, Delicious is a way of sharing those with a wider audience. Uh, so very similar, you can uh, set it up to either automatically or you can do it manually. Put web pages into your Delicious account and then other people can see what web pages you're visiting on a regular basis. Dig is a social news site. 
uh, where people can submit news stories and then people can dig them up and down. Uh, so kind of like giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And the news stories with the most digs or the most thumbs up get posted to their front page. So it's a way of seeing what news stories right now people are reading about and thinking are important for other people to see. It's kind of an interesting mix of whatever you know the big news stories are at the moment with a lot of offbeat kind of funny little things and then uh, a lot of technical stuff too. Dig started out as kind of a technology news site before branching out into a much broader spectrum of news. I want to take a moment to mention MMORPGs, or Massively Multiplayer Online Role-Playing Games. And these are social sites where people can log in and interact with each other in a virtual world, uh, doing some sort of game. So, for instance, in World of Warcraft, people can log in and play as knights or, or wizards and go around battling goblins and monsters and those sorts of things. Second Life is a site where people can log in and have a, their own little person avatar that can walk around this virtual world, build houses, create things, interact with other people. Uh, Disney owns Club Penguin, which is a game site for much younger kids. Um, they've uh, done a lot of work to really make sure that it's a safe environment for young people to, to be able to get online and play games with each other. So uh, people are using social sites to do gaming as well as just interacting and communicating. Friendster is a site that comes up a lot in conversations about social networking, uh, mainly because they were sort of the first real social networking site on the internet. So they always get kind of put out there as the first one. But they're not real big anymore. In fact, they're kind of a textbook case of bad financial decisions during the dot-com boom. Um, and in fact, nowadays, 90% of their users come from Asia. So they're not real big in the English-speaking world, but in Asia, uh, they continue to be kind of a dominant player in social networking there. And then there's lots of much smaller sort of niche uh, social networking sites around common interests or hobbies. You know, if you're a quilter, you can probably find a quilting social networking site where you can connect with other quilters. Lots of uh, churches have set up faith-based social networking sites. Uh, there's things for moms or any sort of uh, particular interest that you can have. Chances are you can find a social networking site for it. And this thing kind of brings us to the free advice portion uh, of the show. Uh, and like I said, I want to start out with just some real general advice on getting involved in social networking uh, if, if you've never done it before. Kind of some tips for getting started. And the first tip I have is to know what it is that you want to get out of social networking. Now, this you don't need to have you know a hard and fast goal or something like that, but just kind of a, a general sense. Are you going to be using this to keep keep in touch with friends or get back in touch with friends that you may have lost touch with? Uh, are you trying to find a job? Do you want to do some sort of professional networking? Uh, are you just trying to connect with other enthusiasts at one of those smaller hobby sites? Know what it is that you want, and that will help you decide where to start, what site would best meet your goal. Similarly, ask your real-life friends where they're at online. Uh, you know, ask the people that you work with or your family what social networking sites they use, because that then may give you an idea of where it would be best for you to start, because if you go where your friends are already at, A, they can help you out if you have questions, because they've already been involved, and B, you'll already have people right off the bat that you can uh, friend or connect with on these sites, uh, so that you're not just out there without any connections. You can actually get involved and, and start really getting into the meat of what social networking is all about. Next, learn to use the privacy settings. Each of these sites has some sort of privacy settings where you can restrict who's allowed to see your information. Uh, Facebook, for example, uh, by default, your information is only accessible to your friends. So no one else can see your information except for those people that you have specifically friended on that site. Uh, now you might want to open that up. Uh, for instance, I think on my profile I actually open up so that uh, my friends of friends can see like my work place and where I've gone to school, and that's just a, a, a way so that those people can see if I'm actually the, the Jonathan Sullivan they're looking for. Uh, but otherwise, I keep that information just restricted to friends so that I know who has access to my information and not just anyone can be, can be seeing my updates and my pictures and things like that. So learn how to use those privacy settings. Next, be selective in who you friend. Uh, you know, you don't have to have a large list. Uh, choose those people that you actually know. Uh, sometimes you'll get uh, people that you don't know who are just looking to expand their friend list uh, just so that they can say they've got a thousand or two thousand friends on MySpace or whatever. Uh, but you don't need to do that. Uh, 
choose quality over quantity. Uh, and, and maybe choose the people you don't see day to day. I know one of the big advantages for Facebook for me has been that I can keep up with my cousins. I have a large number of cousins, and we're kind of spread out across the Midwest. But uh, with Facebook, you know, I can see what's going on in their lives and, and keep up with my family. In the past, I could only do that through my mom when she would call me on the weekends and tell me who's pregnant or who's getting married. Uh, and she might forget for a month or two to tell me those things. Nowadays, I'm the one telling her because my cousins put that information up and I know almost instantaneously um, who's getting married or having a baby. So I, I, I'm actually the, uh, the news person <laughs> in the family now. Uh, kind of displaced my mom. I don't know how she feels about that, but... Uh, you know, by, by uh, having those connections with people that I don't normally talk with, uh, it, it lets me keep involved in their lives and know what's going on. And finally, if you're going to get involved, <clears throat> involved in social networking, use it. Which isn't to say that you have to post a whole lot or be on there every hour, but work at your own comfort level. Uh, you know, kind of choose a schedule that feels right to you. If you want to be on there every day or every week, that's fine. Just as long as you're using it and keeping it up to date, because, um, you know, just a, an empty profile doesn't, uh, doesn't help your friends who want to know what's going on in your life. And then just to, to uh, uh, sort of the final piece here, I want to give some specific ideas for teachers and catechists who might be thinking about using social networking and just kind of some some guidelines to think about and these aren't necessarily hard and fast rules uh, except maybe for the first one but uh, just some things to think about that uh, will be helpful to you in, in your positions and the first thing I want to say is please don't set up false accounts to try to access other people's information uh, especially your students uh, you know, I sometimes hear about teachers or principals who uh, set up an account pretending to be a student at the school to try to access the student's information to see what's going on and how they're using it. Uh, I, I think that's a bad idea, and I think there's three kind of reasons for it. First, uh, I honestly believe it. it's not a teacher or a catechist job to police students' use of social networking sites. That's really the responsibility of the parent. And I know that we all know that not all parents do a good job of that. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not in your job description to be checking up on your students online. And so I, I, I don't think it's, it's a good idea for that reason. Secondly, it's a violation of the user policies of all these sites. You know, it's against their rules to be setting up false information and be trying to access people's information through that way. So if you get caught, you know, your, your real account could get shut down because you violated those policies. So you put yourself at risk that way. And finally, it's just a violation of the privacy of our students. Uh, you know, I think schools are starting to be a lot better about talking to students about social networking and trying to impress on them that they want to keep their information private and not to just allow anyone access to it. And so I think it sends the wrong message if we say, maintain your privacy, uh, be careful who you friend, but then we're going to turn around and lie to you to get access to your information. I think it, it just sets a, a, a bad message and isn't the way that we want to be presenting ourselves as Catholic schools and, and parishes. So uh, don't set up dummy accounts. It, it's uh, just not a good idea. Similarly, I, I discourage teachers and catechists from friending their students. Uh, my personal rule of thumb is I won't friend anyone under the age of 18 unless I'm related to them. Uh, otherwise, you know, there's... It, there's too many things that could happen, intentionally or not. You could post something on your friend's uh, page or send a comment that gets misconstrued, and so you could find yourself in trouble that way. Um, you know, our students have not reached full maturity, so they may make a bad decision. Maybe they get angry with a grade or a decision that you've made and can send all sorts of stuff onto your page uh, that you wouldn't want posted there. Uh, you know, it's pretty easy to track those things down, but in the meantime, that damage has been done. You've got stuff sitting on your profile that, that you would never want your friends to see. So uh, if you want to, uh, pages like Facebook, you can set up groups. And groups uh, allow people who aren't friends on Facebook to come together and, and talk around a, a specific subject or something. For instance, our diocese has a group for uh, the annual March for Life pilgrimage to Washington, D.C. Uh, but all the people who join that group don't have to be friends themselves, but it's still a way that they then can communicate. So if you want a way to communicate with your students through uh, a social networking site, set up a group for them to join. That way you don't have to friend them, they can't see your information, you can't see theirs, but you still have a means to communicate with them through these sites without having to set up uh, that relationship on there that, that could cause problems down the line. That having been said, if you do become aware of some sort of inappropriate behavior, 
uh, you know, I, I think you have a responsibility to bring it to someone's attention. Uh, if you find out that a student's been posting inappropriate material, you know, talk to uh, their parents. Uh, if you find out that one of your coworkers has been doing something inappropriate, uh, you know, report that to the administrator, be that a, a DRE or a principal. Uh, you know, I think we have that responsibility. And if for whatever reason you become aware of something and you're not comfortable approaching uh, someone about that, take it to your administrator and, and let them handle it. And, uh, you know, certainly if you're in this diocese, if, if you want some assistance with that, if your administrator wants assistance with that, they can contact our office and we'll be happy to, to walk them through a process to, uh, to deal with whatever that inappropriate behavior is. Next, monitor what others are posting about you. Uh, you know, one of the nice features of a thing like Facebook is that you can put pictures up to share with other people, and you can actually tag the people in the pictures. So you can create kind of a little label on top of the picture that says, this is my friend Joe, or this is my friend Jane, or, you know, you can identify the people in the pictures. Now, we don't have control over what pictures are taken of us and what gets posted onto Facebook. Um, so it's possible that someone could take a picture of you doing something that you wouldn't want out there for the public to see. Uh, we hope you're not doing anything that you wouldn't want the public to see, but, uh, you know, it's possible for a picture to be taken or, you know, uh, even photoshopped or something and put up there and then tagged with you so that it shows up uh, attached to your profile. So that if I, for instance, were to tag... Uh, my sister, let's say, uh, there's a little link on, on her Facebook page that says pictures of this person. You click on that link and it brings up all the pictures, not just that she's posted, but pictures that other people have posted that have tagged, that have been tagged with her name. So, I, you know, you can make pictures show up on someone else's profile just by tagging them. Now, whenever you're going to be tagged in a photo, you'll get a little message that says that. So you just want to keep up on those and make sure that anything that's being tagged with your photo isn't something inappropriate, isn't something that you wouldn't want out there for public con consumption. Uh, again, just as, as an example, uh, when I was in college, my friends and I enjoyed theme parties, and we do costume parties and stuff like that. Nothing inappropriate, nothing I'm ashamed of, but certainly some silly pictures of me that are now floating out there on Facebook and tagged with my photo uh, so that other people can see the silly, silliness that I engaged in in college. So, uh, you know, if that's not something, though, that I wanted my friends or co-workers that I friended on Facebook, if it's not something I wanted them to see, I could go in and I could remove that tag. So it's not, uh, it's not like it's just there and then it stays there. I have the option to take away the tag, which doesn't remove the picture. The picture will still be out there, but at least then it's not showing up under my profile uh, as a picture of me. Again, along the same lines, assume anything that you put out on a social networking site could potentially become public information. Uh, and this is really true of anything on the internet. I mean, email is a good example. We tend to think of email as a private communication between me and the person I'm sending it to, but the truth is that person can then forward that email to whoever they like, or print it out, or hand it out to people. So, you know, this isn't a, a truly private means of communication. And the same is true of social networking. I can post something out there with the intention that it will only be visible to my friends, but my friends could then take that and print it or email it or do whatever they wanted with it uh, because it's accessible to them. So uh, don't assume that you can put something up that you wouldn't want to become public and it won't become public. Uh, there's always that possibility. Uh, you know, I think we've all kind of heard of stories of uh, employers who find pictures of employees doing something they shouldn't and get fired for that reason. So just, you know, use common sense, uh, which is kind of really my last piece. Use common sense. Don't do anything that could ever potentially come back and embarrass you or, or cause trouble. Uh, you know, the old rule of thumb, would you want your mother to see it? If the answer is no, probably not a good thing to be putting up on your social networking site. Uh, so, you know, I, I really think, you know, I, I don't want to scare anyone, but I, I think if you use... Uh, these these guidelines, uh, social networking can be a, a great thing and a great tool for people to use. Uh, we don't need to be scared of it as long as we use common sense. And that kind of brings us to the end of the presentation then. Uh, I hope this was helpful to, to all of you. Uh, if you have any further questions, please feel free to email me. Uh, my email address is jsullivan at dio.org. And if you join LinkedIn, please feel free to, to set me up as a connection. Uh, I'm at linkedin.com slash in slash s-u-l-l-i-j-o. Just include in the invitation that you, uh, you listened to or attended this presentation, uh, and I'd be happy to, to add you as a contact through LinkedIn. So 
I uh, want to thank everyone for listening. I also want to thank the uh, Annual Catholic Services Appeal for providing the resources for us to provide these webinars. And uh, God bless you all in your ministries. Take care.